You're watching the new Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Imperva helps organizations protect critical applications, APIs, and data anywhere at scale and with the highest ROI. With an integrated approach combining edge, application security, and data security, Imperva protects companies through all stages of their digital journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the New Stack Makers. I'm your host, Heather Joslin, editor in chief of the New Stack. And today we're going to learn from an ethical hacker about how unethical hackers can gain access to your applications and APIs. And we're going to learn some tricks for how to outsmart those malicious attackers. We're joined today by the aforementioned ethical hacker, Ron Massas, lead vulnerability researcher at Imperva. Hi, Ron. Hey, Heather. Hi. Um, Ron, what does Imperva do and what do you do there? Imperva is a data and application security company. It offers products such as DDoS and bot protection, web application firewalls, and most recently, API security. My job there is basically to make the attacker job harder by continuously finding and reporting vulnerabilities in widely used software and services. Okay, and before we start, we just want to thank Imperva for sponsoring today's conversation. and. Let's get going. Um, first of all, Ron, what is an ethical hacker and how did you become one? So an ethical hacker is a hacker that uses skills for defensive purposes mainly. So we go in, we look for vulnerabilities in network, in systems, in applications. And unlike unethical hackers, we don't exploit these vulnerabilities. We use them to improve the security of the product. Yeah. As to how I became one, I started coding when I was a teenager. From there, I moved to software engineering. I did this for around seven years. And during this time, I found myself um, learning more about secure coding, uh, about different vulnerability types, and just really consuming all the information I can about security until I made the, the transition into security research. What are some of the common things you look for in order to find a vulnerability within an application or an API? So this is really depends on the application. Um, let's say it's, if it's an open source application, I, will, I would obviously go to the source code. Uh, but even if it's not, sometimes looking at the source code of uh, even a website, looking at the JavaScript code, trying to get all the different endpoints that might uh, be there, especially if the website uses the modern frameworks like, like Next.js or Angular, doing those kind of things, but obviously also the common things like looking for cross-site scripting, for variety of database injections. And if we're talking about APIs, I would say um, all the IDORs in the variations, it can be like uh, the broken function level authorization bugs, the broken object level authorization bugs, those kind of things. Um, my understanding too is that a lot of companies have, I guess you can call them zombie APIs or APIs that are not even aware they have, it, the things they don't use anymore or things they've mm -hmm. you know, created that they've forgotten about. It was yeah, I mean, sort totally. of legacy. I mean, is that a, is that a common... Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I do. Usually when I go into an application and uh, if, it's, if it's using this uh, framework or uh, like the, the JavaScript framework, I'm basically looking into the, the code there, uh, unminifying it and trying to get all the endpoints that it uses. This is like one trick that I use very often to find uh, those kind of things, but also like trying different endpoints uh, let's say if there, if there is only a get endpoint to like slash user slash ID, I could try to post to delete and those kind of things. What's the single biggest mistake you see developers and their teams make when it comes to protecting their apps and APIs? So I would say if we include the teams there, it's probably not investing enough in documentation and val validation. Mm -hmm. This is a very common thing that like teams can, you know, run off uh, trying to build things as fast as possible, um, but they forget to actually build the proper contract between different, uh, like the, the API request and response and to, to validate it. 
using things like the Open API standard um, and those sort of sort of things. Other than this, I think that if we look at a particular vulnerability class, it's probably weak authorization, especially in API. So, as I mentioned before, those uh, IDOR bugs, the buff line bola, um, those are pretty common and can have devastating effects. So authorization. So just to to we're talking about there's authentication, like you are you are who you say you are, and then there's authorization. You can have access to this part of um are this part of the system or this these yeah this yeah I can it, it's amazing how many times I found bugs where like there is a invoice uh, endpoint with uh, your invoice ID you just change the ID to something else you add one to it and suddenly you see the invoice of some other user this is like a real thing that happens quite often so people just add a one to an old password or an old an old no, no, not the password, like the, the ID in the URL that uh, belongs oh, okay. to your invoice or something like this. Okay. So if you just change this ID, this identifier, and you get someone else's invoice. Oh, wow. Are there are there other common mistakes developers make when, I mean, there's all this talk about shift left and make sure that developers are more involved in the in creating security from the beginning. Are there other common mistakes developers make when designing applications or APIs that can be that hackers are exploiting? Yeah, so so I would say like before, it's it's about this uh, having a clear understanding of the entire application. So I, mm-hmm. one thing that I see very often is that you know some developers work on a specific microservice and they don't necessarily understand all the different places the API will, will be consumed from and mm-hmm. how it will, uh, and, and what inputs they are getting and from where they're getting them. So being able to, to completely understand who is talking to you and code defensively, have the proper validation in place. And in terms of APIs, I would say like mess assignment vulnerabilities are also still pretty common. In terms of application, I would say that insecure cross-origin communication is pretty common. I recently published a number of blogs about this. I found it in TikTok and some some other companies. It's basically uh, a pretty common place to make mistakes in. Um, so it's pretty common place to make mistakes in configuration. Yeah. So. It's like a front-end attack where uh, mm-hmm. applications expose uh, something called uh, the post message API. So they are listening or sending uh, information to different origins. And when this uh, this feature is not properly configured, different websites can communicate with your site. And this could lead to various vulnerabilities. In the case of TikTok, mm-hmm. it led to... Uh, information disclosure about the user, the things they search, their uh, username, and other information from their account was leaked due to this thing. Yeah. Um, one reason why TikTok is kind of under fire from some from some uh, lawmakers and, and so on is that's Could be, could be. Yeah. Um, we've uh, published some data in the past about how uh, sometimes things are misconfigured because... Um, teams will use the default settings on, you know, their, from their cloud services. Is that some, is that an area that you would highlight for people to pay attention to? Yeah, I think it's definitely getting better. I remember that uh, S3 buckets being exposed on the internet was a pretty common thing. So this is this was the default uh, for some time. Or was it was easy to make it uh, open without uh, <laughs> noticing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but Amazon uh, did a lot of good improvements in, in this uh, respect. So I would say I'm optimistic uh, in, in, in this sense. But obviously, there is other default co- co- configuration that can definitely uh, lead to, to other vulnerabilities. Can you tell us about some of the vulnerabilities you discovered in, say, the past year or so? And was there what was interesting in particular for, about them or caught you by surprise? Yeah, so I would say the most surprising one was a vulnerability I reported this year to Google Chrome. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I found a vulnerability where uh, the file input, uh, basically when, when you upload files, you use an HTML tag with a type of file. I found mm -hmm. that when you directly drop a file onto the input, it somehow circumvent uh, all the security mechanisms uh, that Chrome has in regards to, to file uploads. To be specific, it uh, resolve uh, symbolic links. Mm -hmm. So I, I made a, a proof of concept where I gave the user to download his uh, recovery keys for his account, and I asked them to upload them back just to prove that he, st he stored them. And obviously, if you just downloaded something, uploading it back can't do anything bad, right? So it's, it, it turns out that if you do it, I would be able to read uh, any file on your operating system because Chrome uh, recursively resolves symbolic links under this specific case. If you click on the file input, it's not going to happen. If you if you use the proper way to to upload the file when it's when it's dropped using the on drop event, it's not going to happen. Only this specific action led to this uh, this issue. And I think that what developers can can learn from this is the importance of understanding what symbolic links are, and when mm -hmm. they develop uh, endpoints or APIs or whatever that interacts with files, that gets files and input. If you clone a Git repository, you know, like dynamically based on user input, if there is a file upload endpoint, you should remember that these kind of things can happen, and that that users can upload symbolic links, and there, there could be uh, very bad consequences if you handle those files incorrectly afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, another one that I think can be relevant here is my most recent blog post. It's about DigitalOcean and some vulnerabilities I discover in their APIs. It was a, a idle vulnerability, specifically broken function level authorization bugs. So specifically there, I was able to uh, use a lower level user. So there is a, a role called biller that should only have access to billing information, but I was actually able to see all the team resource, uh, basically information as well as uh, doing some write operations when this was clearly uh, not supposed to work this way. I think that what developers can take from that is that it's extremely important to do the validation at the API level, because if you look at the front end of the DigitalOcean, everything was fine. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that the QA testing the site would also see that everything is fine as acting uh, as it should. But actually, uh, if you talk directly to the API, most of the functionality was exposed. What impact does AI have on ethical hacking and what security risks should developers be aware of if they're using AI tools to write code? Yeah, so what impact it had? I think first it's introduced a completely new attack classes, I would say. Like if, you, if we specifically talk about LLMs, there is a ton of research and a ton of new types of vulnerabilities that have been discovered almost like monthly, like mm -hmm. the, the prompt injection, the model poisoning attacks, and a variety of, of things. So I think this will keep happening and will uh, give me a lot of work. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's good, and, good business for the ethical hacker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Good until times. they replace us, until <laughs> they replace us. Uh, <laughs> and in terms of uh, using AI tools, I can say that I feel at least 50% more productive when I'm using um, ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot. Um, in terms of using a code that those models generate, I saw a number of times that it, it generates code with with vulnerabilities, but with the pace of uh, improvement, I'm optimistic that this would be like something that would get better and not worse. With that said, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, developers should uh, read the code that uh, the model generate, and only after they understood it completely, incorporate it into the project. That's a good. That's a good tip. <laughs> don't, 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 <laughs> uh, don't uh, deploy code that you you don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, maybe and, this and works. It, maybe this works. The, the robot says it, it says it works. I think the dangerous thing is if it works. If you just check it works and you move on, this can be yeah. very bad. 
Uh, one more question. What should developers keep in mind when building applications or APIs to make them more secure? So what are some best practices, some tricks to outsmart attackers that, that people should keep in mind? So I think having robust logging is very important. So you want to be able to log anything that is unexpected. Uh, mm -hmm. This will help you recover from a vulnerability uh, or detect that there was an exploit uh, uh, sooner. Having those this uh, planning, understanding who is going to consume your, your API or microservice is also extremely important. Um, and embedding what so-called security champions inside the the development name, I think it's also extremely important and, and lacking a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, security teams often seems as like they are a burden of some sort of on the <laughs> developer teams. And, and it's very bad. I think that it's creates some kind of uh, fatigued in, in, the, in the developers. And I think that uh, it's something that should come from within the team, uh, like treating security as, as part of the development process, truly, and having someone that is really curious about this and incorporate this into the, the development lifecycle. Mm -hmm. And code reviews. I think code reviews is also very important and can also be used to educate the, the developers as they submit code. Yeah, you mentioned that um, developers sometimes are resistant to the security um, having mm -hmm. a security champion or, or having to think too much about what they perceive as too much about security. Do you have any advice for sort of breaking down that cultural divide between developers and, and security experts? Yeah. I, I think that both sides are somewhat in fault. I think this, that security teams uh, can often be seems to make a big deal of something that is not really a big deal. So let's say that there is some uh, dependency that is not patched, which is bad, you should update it. But I think that there is a difference between a dependency that is not patched that is exploitable and just a dependency that is that, that we can upgrade. That, that we can upgrade. Yeah. Um, and I think this is where uh, the problem comes from, from this kind of uh, inaccuracies on, on what is urgent and what is not urgent, and actually showing the impact of uh, what you want developers uh, to fix. Um, again, from the developer side, it's just uh, being curious about security, learning about uh, new threats, and uh, building a culture that fosters th this kind of uh, approach. Okay, okay, and that's not. That Seems like a good place to wrap it up. Um, we'd like to thank Ron Massas for, from Imperva for joining us today. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. And we want to thank Imperva for sponsoring our conversation. And we'd like to thank all of you for uh, joining us today. This has been Heather Joslin for the New Stack Makers. We'll see you next time. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.